you members of the jury might pause and consider a matter that I am sure by now is readily apparent to you. Whereas it takes only a few sentences to assert a lie, it may take 10 or 20 pages to disclose all of the facts that disprove the lie. This is the big advantage that an assassination sensationalist has in a film, a magazine interview, a television interview, or a public debate. In 15 minutes of talk, he can make 15 false allegations, all of which may sound plausible to any person who does not have all the facts. It may take 15 minutes to reply fully to just two or three of these false allegations, and generally the detailed assertion underlying the truth is not nearly as intriguing as the assertion of the falsity. Fifteen days earlier, on March 16th, the Chief Justice had made the determination that the autopsy photographs and x-rays would not be introduced into evidence. The reason for this decision was that the Kennedy family, through Robert Kennedy, brother of the late president, did not want these pictures and x-rays to become a matter of public display. This was reinforced by the argument that such a decision would have no effect on the veracity of the testimony of the pathologists who performed the autopsy because these x-rays and photographs would eventually be released and the testimony could then be double-checked. If this was the desire of the Kennedy family, perhaps a compromise could have been reached to keep the photographs out of the record and to introduce the x-rays. Even this, however, would have been a less than satisfactory solution. My basic position as a citizen and as an independent attorney working with the commission was that we were entitled to have all the evidence. The public had a right to know. Although I could understand the desires of the Kennedy family, I nevertheless believed that their desire for privacy was outweighed by the need for public knowledge on what actually happened in Dallas on November 22nd. Once a person runs for high national office, that person and his family have to expect a loss of privacy. Moreover, even in the case of a private citizen, certain rights of privacy would yield to public policy in solving a murder. Thus, I argued that the widow of Officer J.D. Tippett could not have prevented any examination of her husband's body in connection with the investigation of a murder. Why should the widow of the family of President Kennedy be treated any differently? This leads into an area that gave me the greatest cause for concern while I served with the Warren Commission in Washington. There is a dangerous trend toward preferred treatment for high government officials coupled with a dangerous trend in which high government officials tend to think of themselves as some sort of elite similar to the nobility of an 18th century European monarchy. This was evident in the relationship that developed between some of the commissioners and the lawyers. For instance, even though the room where the commissioners met was on the same floor of the small building where the commission was headquartered, the commissioners seldom took time to visit with the lawyers working in their own offices to find out how the investigation was developing. During the meetings of the commissioners, the lawyers on the commission staff were excluded even though it was the lawyers who were undertaking the investigation. The elite concept was also apparent from the fact that Robert Kennedy was able to prevail over the desires of counsel in areas 1 and 2 by withholding the autopsy photographs and x-rays. When Governor Connolly testified, even Senator Russell, otherwise seldom an active participant, was present, and surely Governor Connolly was no more important a witness than Howard Brennan, who saw the assassin fire at the motorcade. 
when the drafts of our final report were presented for the commissioners to review, their deference to Governor Connolly was so great that they directed a revision and a major conclusion of the commission that resulted in an outright misstatement of fact. This revision involved the single bullet theory. You will find it on page 19 of the report, conclusion number three. It states, Although it is not necessary to any essential findings of the commission to determine just which shot hit Governor Connolly, there is very persuasive evidence from the experts to indicate that the same bullet which pierced the president's throat also caused Governor Connolly's wounds. However, Governor Connolly's testimony and certain other factors have given rise to some difference of opinion as to this probability, but there is no question in the mind of any member of the commission that all the shots which caused the President's and Governor Connolly's wounds were fired from the sixth floor window of the Texas School Book Depository. Bellin continues, The plain fact is that it is absolutely necessary to the findings of the commission to determine whether the same bullet that pierced the president's throat also caused Governor Connolly's wounds. Otherwise, where did that first bullet go? It was not in President Kennedy's body, and there was no extensive damage to the presidential limousine of the nature that could be caused by a bullet traveling at the speed we determined under the wound ballistics tests, which you jurors will soon review. Governor Connolly was simply wrong in his testimony, just as President Johnson was wrong in some of his observations, and just as almost every witness to a sudden and startling event is incapable of being completely accurate. In the case of President Johnson, he merely filed an affidavit. He did not undergo any interrogation by commission counsel. Surely, if we could interrogate Mrs. Kennedy, whose husband had died before her eyes, there was no reason why President Johnson should not be examined in the same manner as every other witness. Moreover, there was a special reason for not giving the President favored treatment. There was some speculation from abroad, however outlandish, that he might have had some indirect connection with the Dallas tragedy because it resulted in his elevation to the presidency. One of the basic lessons of the Warren Commission investigation is the ramifications that arise when special treatment is given to a favored few. The reverberations from the decision to withhold publication of the autopsy photographs and x-rays will be felt for many decades as a part of the overall diminution of the confidence that the American people have in the integrity of their elected officials.